joining us tonight at, at the virtual table. I'm pleased to introduce to everyone Robert Costa, who many of you must know by now as the co-author with Bob Woodward of the bestseller Peril. Robert is a national political reporter at the Washington Post. He's a former host and moderator of Washington Week on PBS. He's been a political analyst on NBC News and MS on BC. We could claim him almost as a Chicagoan because he is a graduate of Notre Dame. His master's is from the University of Cambridge and we got to know each other on the campaign trail during the 2012 campaign. I'm gonna jump right into it in the news. Robert, thanks for joining us today. As you know, the January 6th committee is expected to subpoena Eastman, John Eastman next week. That was a significant uh, finding in your book. Could you just give us an update and what you know is the latest about his coming and briefly explain one of the biggest scoops in your book. And Laura, I know you have questions uh, about the writer's room that our readers wanted to know. Uh, Robert, please do, please start us off on the big John Eastman news of tonight. Lynn and Laura, it's wonderful to be with you. I love the Chicago Sun-Times. Your political coverage is trenchant and excellent. And uh, it was fun being with you in Chicago a few weeks ago, Lynn. But on the Eastman memo, the, the real story here is that the January 6th committee, it's evident, is expanding its investigation. What began as a process of interviewing Capitol Police officers and looking at the violence of the day of January 6th has now uh, become something that's much broader. It's about the planning of an insurrection, both on the ground level in terms of the people who walked up to the Capitol and attacked it, but also those who plan the legal and political battle. And one of those figures is John Eastman, a conservative lawyer who authored a two page six point plan that in a very brief way outlined uh, uh, what many people are calling a blueprint for a coup, a coup d'etat to throw the election to the House of Representatives. And it's going to be difficult for this January 6th committee, Congressman Kinzinger, the moderate Republican and others on it to figure out the facts here, because while we've uncovered some documents and they have some witnesses at this point, a lot of people are not cooperating. President Trump has asserted executive privilege, so they have an uphill climb. So, Laura, why don't you take over for something, because I know our readers want to get sure. into the writer's room questions, and then we'll come back to it. Just wanted to take some uh, top news right off. Sure, absolutely. Right. It's, it's, there's so much to talk about here. Thanks, Lynn. And, and Robert, congratulations on this very hot and very important book. Great job. I want to step back for a moment and, and take take the our audience into the writer's room, so to speak. One of, one of the things we do with, with this show is we always try to solicit questions from the audience. And here's a, a, we have a great one from the audience to, to kick this off. And that's from coming from Andy Knott. And Andy asks, uh, Bob Woodward has a franchise on these kinds of reporting projects. How did you become his partner on this one? Bob Woodward and I have known each other for many years. We interviewed Trump together actually on March 31st, 2016, five years ago, uh, when he was about to become the Republican nominee, we sat down with him for about 90 minutes. And Bob Woodward's first two books on Trump, Fear and Rage, the titles of those books were both taken from quotes from that interview. One quote was, real power is fear. Trump said that to us. He also told us he always brings the rage out. So Woodward and I have always had a rapport as colleagues at the Washington Post. We interviewed Trump together. And when he was looking at his third book on Trump on the final days, he said, let's do it together. And I thought to myself, why not learn how to write a book from the master himself, Bob Woodward? And he is so old school in his method. Interview people for hours, transcribe it, think it through, build up the scenes. Well, that's exactly, that was leading right into my next question, which there's something known in Washington is, is the Woodward method. He's written, you know, what is it, close to a couple dozen books, something like that. And he and he's and he has a style. Could you could you expand a little bit more on what that style is and why he's so good at it? He really drills down to find out what happened and gets to what I call the emotional truth of what really happened, as well as the details that are recounted by eyewitnesses who are in the room or deeply familiar with what happened. And when we did this project, he would guide me from time to time 
to really understand the context of what was happening. I, I will give you an example. On January 5th, 2021, the night before the insurrection, we have a scene in the book of Trump opening the door of the Oval Office to listen to the mob outside. He loves the sounds of the mob on the streets of Washington, even though it's a freezing cold night in the city. And he told me that this is important because it shows a president somewhat isolated, turning to his supporters in a crisis moment in his presidency. It reminded him of his own book with Carl Bernstein from 1976, The Final Days on Richard Nixon. But Nixon wasn't talking to the mob. As you might remember, Nixon was famously or perhaps infamously talking to the pictures of presidents on the wall at the White House. Yeah, that's, that's an eerie parallel there. So you, you worked on this together. Um, you'd never worked with him on a book before. Uh, you did a, a, like something like 200 interviews for this book. How did you all approach this as a team and how did you d divide up the work and figure out who was gonna do what? We all have our own sources in journalism. Uh, and Woodward and I started off with our different relationships across the board. But as the project went on, we did a lot of interviews together. We would do them in a very discreet way, having people over to his home or my home, uh, rarely over the phone, really trying to talk to people to bring them out of their shells, bring them out of their talking points to get to that core truth of what really happened. And do you have notes? Do you have a diary you can share, a transcript of a phone call? And, and push people to share more, to not just be kind of in their talking point public mode. It took a lot of time. At first, when you're writing a book, you think the story may be X, but eventually it becomes Y. And that was really the case with January 6th. We also decided to cover both Biden and Trump, two presidencies in depth, because it was our belief that, and others may disagree with this framing, that you can't really understand Biden in his moment without understanding Trump. And yet to understand the final days of Trump, you have to understand who beat him and how that happened. And so we try to present both of those stories as an intertwined storyline. That's, that's really interesting. And one, one of the things you said earlier that really struck me is you, you talk about the emotional aspect of what you're doing. It's not just you want to get people out of those talking points. How do you get people to, to, to be emotional? You talk about getting them, you know, sitting down with them in their homes, away from the fray. What, what other strategies do you, did you use to, to bring people out? Let me put it this way. If I sat down with you and asked you about your mother or father, respectfully, you probably have a, a pat story or two. You often tell people you don't really know well about your mother and father. Most people do. And when it comes to current events, it's a lot like that. I'll sit down with someone who was in the White House with Trump or alongside Biden during the campaign. And for 30 minutes, maybe even an hour, they'll give me a nice roundabout story about different events and different people. But Woodward's method, which he taught me, was to keep your rear end on the chair for another hour, a third hour, a fourth hour. And I bet you, and I don't want to bring your family into this, if I asked you about your mother or father for five or six hours, a little bit of a different story you would be telling by the end of that conversation. We all really want to get to where how we really feel about things and what we really saw. It just takes time. And that's the luxury of doing a book. You have time. Well, it's, in other words, you wear them down. <laughs> that's a better way of putting it. Much, much, much sharper. Fascinating. Thank you very much, Robert. I'll turn it back over to Lynn. And thank you, Laura. So, Robert, as you know, so much of the book has provided the uh, underpinnings of the January 6th committee. Uh, take us into the bunker. You write about it. That night in the bunker is now a, a, a story that is amplified in the last few days because of the work of the January 6th committee, because of the criminal charges now that may, may be pending against Steve Bannon for resisting the committee. So you write about this uh, bunker, this setup, and could you tell us about it and then make the connection to the work of the January 6th committee now that they know it happened and what they're trying to excavate in their work? It's a great question, Lynn. And the January 6th committee has cited our book in its subpoenas uh, for one specific reason, though there are several citations. In our book, we show 
that on January 5th, Donald Trump is in the Oval Office pressuring Pence to push the election into the House to throw out electors. He fails to convince Pence to do that. And when he fails, he decides to call in via phone to the war room across the street at the Willard Hotel in a suite of rooms managed by Rudy Giuliani, Steve Bannon, Trump advisor Jason Miller. The rooms we later found out through a Washington Post report were actually being paid for by the Trump campaign. But Trump calls in and he updates the Bannon and Giuliani crowd on Pence. They talk through what to do now. They issue a statement from the campaign in Trump's name, defining Pence as in lockstep with Trump, even though that was a lie. And so by showing in our reporting that Trump was coordinating with Bannon and Giuliani on the eve of the insurrection, we've shown a connection between the presidency and these outside agitators on the Trump legal and political side ahead of January 6th. And that's really important for the committee because it wants to figure out what was the president actually doing. And you have all these different power centers on the right wing of this country colliding in a sense on January 5th. Outside of the Willard Hotel are the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys, white supremacist groups, Trump supporters. Inside the Willard Hotel, Bannon and Giuliani, Roger Stone was staying there. And then you have across the street, Donald Trump. And what we tried to figure out is the through line, but there's still more to be reported on, a lot of targets, both for possibly the committee and reporters. So if you had Eastman, and I guess, again, the news today is that this, he may get a subpoena next week, you learned a lot just getting his six point plan to overturn the election there. Uh, what else do you think he knows that the committee needs to know? Or Eastman's so pivotal, Lynn, because as our book shows, he was not just some academic writing a memo from the political sidelines. He is part of a chronology that really tells the story of what happened on January 6th. In brief, he's in the Oval Office on January 4th, two days before the insurrection, and he presents the argument to Pence to his face with Trump standing next to him. And Trump is saying to Pence, listen to Eastman, listen to Eastman. And they have this scheme legally to throw out electors, delay the certification, and try to get state legislatures to propose alternate slates of electors. It sounds complicated, and uh, I know it can be hard to follow. But it, it, to understand it, they basically wanted to stop the certification so Republicans and state legislatures could figure out a way to convince themselves and maybe even the Congress that Trump deserved to win and deserved to be elected in the House, not by the Electoral College. It, this was it was a it's a winding plan, but it was very serious. Right, and John Eastman is a graduate, by the way, of the University of Chicago Law School. I'm I'm not sure the University of Chicago Law School loves you bringing that up. <laughs> it's part of the it's part of the record. So the 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 work of the committee seems to you know, um, the point is they want the information if. Um, Attorney General Merrick Garland decides to pursue criminal charges against Steve Bannon, it could be a long time uh, before we know it, before there's a case, before there's a trial. Uh, it seems the committee needs the information more than they need a conviction for uh, Bannon uh, flouting their subpoena. And, and it now opens the door to see if Eastman is going to do that too. Uh, can the committee in any way, do you think, work around it that is the to be determined thing, because you're right. Steve Bannon, knowing him for over a decade as a reporter, may be defiant until the end. As Michael Wolf, the uh, fellow Trump author the other day said, maybe even Bannon welcomes the idea of going to jail. And I'm not going to contest uh, Michael Wolf's conclusion on that, because there is an aspect of Bannon's personality that welcomes this kind of uh, political and legal warfare. Uh, and he certainly does not seem willing to comply with the subpoena in any way. That's why they have the criminal contempt. Eastman uh, remains, well, he's confusing me about where he actually stands on his own memo with all these different statements that are in private and public about it. Here's what I would say for the committee's success at this point. They need a John Dean 
in Watergate, John Dean was the White House counsel for Nixon, and he acknowledged criminality. He put his hand in the air before the Watergate committee and said, I was the White House counsel for Nixon. I committed a crime, and I was part of a conspiracy to commit a crime. When Dean did that, it broke open Watergate because it was someone from the inside acknowledging criminal activity. So far, there has not been a John Dean type witness from inside the Trump circle to say this was a conspiracy. That, that's so important. And I can't figure, do you have any candidates? Do you see anyone who would do it? Well, I know a lot of people who are deeply involved with Trump at the end, but I, don't, I can't read their moral compass or their willingness to testify. Which brings us to one of your big conclusions and the title of the book, of course, uh, that we are at a peril and uh, we are at a threat to our democracy. In the last few days, we've seen how President Trump has promised to launch his own media company to challenge Twitter and Facebook. Uh, what do you see I, as the, uh, is the peril amplified if, if Trump and Trumpism gets this new social media platform and it actually works and uh, they can challenge Twitter or Facebook? The, the peril, in my view, as a reporter is not so much about his social media footprint at this point. It's about his possible ascent again to the presidency, because when he entered the presidency, he was a total outsider who was somewhat of a novice when it came to utilizing the levers of power. By the end of his presidency, he was fully comfortable with how to pressure the Department of Justice lawmakers, the vice president. He knew how to wield the hammer of power. And he became uh, very aggressive in using it across the board on the federal level, even the state level. And so the peril is, if this person, Donald Trump, wins the presidency again, what will he do if he actually has power again? Because he's tested American democracy to the extreme. He has tried to contest an election by claiming fraud when there was no fraud, uh, by pushing his entire party to echo him on his claims. And what he's doing right now is he's not formally announced for 2024, but he's out there doing campaign rallies yeah. and saying the election was stolen. And so this is not a former president like Nixon who gets on a helicopter or Jimmy Carter who goes back to Plains or the Bushes who go back to Texas. This is someone who wants back in the arena. Well, and he's pretty effective too. Uh your, your book sets the stage for the, this next chapter that we're in, where we have the uh, various challenges to election laws going on right now, uh, Robert. We have, uh, in a sense, laying the groundwork for uh, Republicans to challenge elections before they're happening and change the way that we vote. Uh, also, do you find it interesting that we now are in a stage where people who are the election deniers also become the anti-maskers and the anti-vaxxers? It's something I encounter as a reporter all the time. I'll walk up to people uh, at events, even in a COVID time, and they will say to me, oh, you're with the mainstream media, you, you are fake news. And that, it's been become more visceral and angry in the last five years in a way it wasn't even 10 years ago when you and I were first meeting each other and talking on the campaign trail. We have such a deeply divided country where faith in institutions has eroded to the raw bone, and there's really not a lot of it there. People are in their own political orbits, on social media, in social circles. We're even more isolated with a pandemic. So my optimism is not really there in terms of a national consensus on facts or a political reality. But I do think it's important to just stay cool and focus on the democratic issues and, and the democratic truth out there, uh, not in the party sense, but in a broader fundamental civic sense. So do you think, you know, you write a lot about Mike Pence and, and mm. uh, you, you have that, what was one of the first big stories out of the book that he got uh, and how he was pressured so much to, to do something, to throw the election and he didn't. Okay, so he is laying the groundwork in a way for his own run for president. Do you have a sense that he could, that he has the uh, backbone to run if Trump decides to get in the race? I don't, I don't want to predict anything because who knows what happens, but I don't see him as a likely contender or a major contender if Trump runs. At this point, it looks like a lot of people from Secretary of State Pompeo to Mike Pence 
to Ron DeSantis of Florida are all positioning themselves for the possibility that Trump, for whatever reason, chooses not to run in 2024, and they want to be positioned to be the inheritors, the successors to the Trump movement, the Trump political power. Uh, but it's hard for them to have any kind of competing political capital at this point against this major global celebrity who has a mass movement behind him on the right. And doesn't it, isn't it amazing, no matter what the revelations are in your book from the January 6th committee, what other reporters are getting, uh, nothing seems to uh, impact, make a dent in, in the growth of Trumpism. I mean, we see it at, in, in a lot of parts of Illinois, Northern Illinois, Chicagoans are a little inoculated against it because it is so democratic. But, uh, you know, downstate Illinois and far Northern Illinois and McHenry County, we have strong pockets of uh, not only people who voted for Trump, that I get if just in electing someone, but this Trumpism is, is sticking and it then this Trumpism is, 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 feeds into the election denial that feeds into this whole thing. Uh, I'm well, just, but Lynn, 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 I would, I would, I would jump, I would jump on that and, and, and add to that. Yes, it's out there, but is that and put the question to Robert? Is that enough for, for even if Trump runs for re-election, even if he whips all that up again? Is that enough? When I see the polls, the polls don't reflect that most people support that the election should be overturned, and most people do not support the idea that it was stolen. Most people do not support uh, that we should that we we shouldn't get vaccinated. So. Is there, a, is there enough out there in terms of the, the, the political landscape, in terms of the support that he might be able to gain for him to really have a chance to win the presidency? Well, he's definitely in position to win the Republican nomination. He, there were some disasters on Trump's part in 2020 uh, for the Republicans to lose Georgia, to lose Georgia Senate seats uh, in a red part of the South, even though Georgia is changing in a rapid way in some in some respects demographically. It, it was a political uh, crisis for the GOP in 2020 in terms of where they lost. But let's not forget to answer your question and Lynn's that Donald Trump changed the Republican Party, made it anti-free trade or at least protectionist on trade. He became much more incendiary and hard right on immigration, non-interventionist on foreign policy. And so he created a new message for a Republican Party that had grown sclerotic and politically brittle during the Romney nomination and the years after that. He reinvigorated it politically in terms of going into the Midwest again and having support because of how it framed itself on immigration and trade. And it's, it is interesting that that support and appeal has remained, even though he was impeached twice, connected to an insurrection, and based on our reporting, shredded and tested every single democratic norm in this country. Despite all that, the political appeal I outlined still seems to have a lot of uh, uh, strength with some voters, swing voters in places like uh, Southern Illinois, Wisconsin, Ohio, et cetera. So in other words, his supporters are, are, are willing to overlook the impeachments, the insurrections, et cetera, et cetera, because they, they believe fundamentally in his version of Republicanism. And they may, and they may not even believe in his Republicanism. He, he's not for cutting social spending, unlike Romney and Ryan and all these other Republicans. He's but he gives the Republicans enough of what they want, which is an overhaul of the Fed judiciary, low taxes. But what's part of Trump's appeal, and I've covered him for years, is he is not so much a political figure to many people, but a cultural figure. And he represents to them, uh, uh, he's a weaponization of their anger against what they see as establishment and elite culture. So they forgive him for so much of his conduct, uh, which many voters find appalling. And some Republicans even find appalling. But because he has cultural resonance, there's a lot of defensiveness among his core voters. See, one of the things that came out of the Trump era in the beginning, you know, reporters did fact checks, uh, reality checks. Uh, it, first, they lagged by a few days, then real time. Everybody's got it down. Uh, the idea that there is, it, and I've talked to Trump supporters, I'm sure, Laura, we all have. Sometimes I wonder if people could agree 
in, in these interviews of today is Thursday because it, it and it, it's deeper than just distrust of the press. I would think there'd be a, a, a there would be one day, uh, one day maybe there'd be a way of figuring it out better. But I hate to say this, uh, we have not figured out, have we, a way to, as reporters, to even make a dent into just this untruthfulness, uh, the fact-based uh, statements that are factless that uh, Trump uh, puts out there. And you're reporting. Have you come upon any method? I'm just curious. Well, you just, you just got to keep reporting and you're doing it, Lynn. And it's we just have to keep shining a light on both Republicans and Democrats and what they're doing. But it's, especially with Republicans right now who are really testing democracy in some of these states, uh, we got to really make sure we cover all of that activity in the states, cover both parties in a civil but very aggressive way. And that, that I think sometimes the civil and aggressive approach allows, if you just show Republican voters who are obsessed with Trump, the facts of what he did, you can't turn away from hard facts. Well, except I cover Adam Kinzinger pretty heavily, and that's what he's been trying to do for months. And he, it still has only earned him uh, in, in uh, it has only earned him perhaps a one-way ticket out of elected office in Illinois, uh, where his political future is, is tough right now because of the growing strength of Trump Republicans. Everything you said is what Congressman Kinzinger is trying to do, lay out facts, uh, get rid of conspiracy, you know, to address, address front of conspiracy theories. But I haven't seen the uh, reaction in a big grassroots way that um, perhaps the congressman thought. And that is something um, you talked a lot about as we're in our final minutes here, Robert, about this democracy crisis in this country. Are we in a crisis now that is, uh, shows any sign of abating? And is it all tied at this point to whether or not Trump decides to run for president? The crisis in brief to me is something that looms ahead of 2024. The John Eastman memo outlined a plan to throw the election to the House by saying there were alternate electors out there. Of course, there were not alternate electors out there in 2020 or 2021. What happens next time if there are? In other words, if Republicans are more organized in the states and have state legislatures ready to throw new electors, new alternate electors to Congress ahead of the certification. You could have a constitutional crisis about which electors should be counted, who actually won the election, and the ultimate constitutional crisis would be two people showing up to the inauguration claiming to be president with no real answer if Congress isn't certified or it's not seen as a credible certification. And to me, it's almost like that movie Star Wars where there's that one gap in the system for the Death Star, uh, the big ship. In American democracy, there is a gap here. If people manipulate the electors and how it's certified in Congress, you could see a major constitutional crisis not that far away. I'm not a doomsday person, but I do think about the Eastman memo and what if a few things had changed? What could have happened this time and what could happen next time? So Robert, as, as we close this out, the whole point now of the Eastman memo may be not that it's something that happened in the past, but what he did in those six pages is set up the prologue for the future. Well, uh, we, we shall see. The New York Times did say this book reads a lot like prologue for the future, uh, but I don't. We'll, we'll have to just keep tracking it, and as you do at the Chicago Sun Times, just keep reporting, tell the story, and we'll do that. Robert, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Thank you. Great to have you, Robert. And maybe we'll we'll be seeing a uh, we'll be seeing a sequel from you, depending on how things work out. Look forward to seeing that. Thank, Thank you. you.